Pericioni. And uh, as Warren said, I have worked in the past three years uh, uh, under this task of the Radonorm project, which is about assessing the impact of various types of radon protective and remedial measures on the environment. I was uh, supervised by Professor Martin Hiranek, that is also here in the call today. So thank you very much for him, uh, supervision, and uh, to the whole Radonorm project that gave me this opportunity in the past years. So, um, this task about environmental assessment was under the World Package 5 that uh, aimed to uh, develop new mitigation strategies and optimize the already existing ones in order to reduce the exposure uh, to radon in both dwelling and workplaces. In particular, my task uh, was in between uh, task 5.1 and 5.3, because uh, the 5.1 was about the overview of regulatory approach it, approaches and international standard uh, that uh, are aimed to control radon in um, buildings in general, and 5.3 that was more focused on uh, the sustainability and variability of radon mitigation system. Uh, as you, um, I'm sure everyone you, of you know, uh, the radon control, uh, the radon concentration indoor in the buildings is uh, uh, regulated by the Directive 2013-59 or uh, Euratom that uh, uh, established that must be uh, um, indoor concentration below the reference level established uh, of 300 becquerel per cubic meter. So in case a radon concentration indoor is above that level, mitigation uh, prevent a corrective measure must be uh, implemented in the building itself. This problem of uh, high radon indoor is present uh, mostly in Europe and in those countries such as Canada that uh, are uh, um, privileging eating indoors uh, and where the high temperature difference between outdoors and indoors is very high. Uh, radon is a naturally occurring gas, uh, as you um, know, and uh, it differs the concentration uh, soil by soil according to the permeability and the composition of the ground itself. Uh, gas radon can penetrate the building through different waves. The first one is a crack and fracture in the floor foundation level, uh, floor joints. The third one could be cavities in the inner walls, uh, severage and drains. Uh, building material and last uh, in a small amount from domestic water. So once the radon is inside the building, it tends to accumulate in those spaces that are directly in contact with the ground. And uh, if those uh, areas are habitable room, it can be very dangerous for people living there because radon can be inhalated and tends to accumulate also in lands. So as you know, and also the Radonon project is really focused on that, uh, radon can, uh, can be uh, um, the second cause of lung cancer just after tobacco smoking. So that's why it's very important to protect our building from the entrance of radon. So the content of this presentation, basically, it's uh, mm, divided in four main parts. The first part uh, is devoted to the life cycle assessment methodology. Uh, that I have used uh, to calculate the environmental impact. So I would like to get you a bit more familiar with this methodology that is worldwide used to calculate uh, the impact of a product, building, or uh, every material on the environment. The second point on the list is the comparison of radon proof membrane um, that uh, we have compared in order to understand uh, what membrane is the most environmental friendly while compared to the radon resistance. The third point is a comparison of ventilation system and operating modes aimed to diluting the radon indoors and of course um, compared to the uh, environmental impact. And the last point is a sort of panoramic overview of a floor foundation that presents both active and passive solution, either uh, suitable for new and existing buildings. So let's start to dive in in the first point of the list with the life cycle assessment methodology. Uh, the life cycle assessment is also uh, called LCA, so maybe mm, you know already this term, uh, it's a very a hot topic right now. And uh, the life cycle assessment is worldwide recognized and uh, it is defined by four main phases. The first one, it's defined as goal and scope. In this uh, uh, phase, we need to understand what we need to measure, what we need to assess. 
So we need to define uh, the products and material building that we need to assess in terms of environmental impacts. We need to understand which part of the life cycle of a product or material we need to consider. And uh, uh, most important is uh, what category, uh, environmental category, we need to consider. So uh, you can see on the right side of this slide that there are uh, several uh, around 10, 11 uh, environmental impact category that are mostly used in the construction industry to understand the impact of material and products on the environment. It's very important to understand that uh, these environmental categories don't share the same unit of measure, but they have different units. So, for example, the most recurrent one uh, that we are uh, used to know is the global warming potential. So, basically, the impact of this environmental category is referred to kilograms of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere. And uh, there are others such as acidification potential with another unit of measure or eutrophication and so on. So that's very important. Let's bear it in mind that because after when I will show you some result, it will come back. Another important point uh, of this phase is uh, to define the boundary condition. So what we need to exclude from our assessment. The second phase is the so-called life cycle inventory. So basically in this phase, we need to collect and structure the data set. Uh, the life cycle inventory, it can be either based on the so-called environmental product declaration that are called also APDs. An APD is a, a standardized document that inform about a product environmental and human health impact. Basically, uh, companies can, uh, manufacturing company, industry company can decide to let uh, their product be certified by this uh, sustainability certification for products so that uh, everyone can know how their product uh, is impacting the environment. So that is very interesting because APD are both available uh, online in open access databases while uh, also in uh, some uh, life cycle assessment software and internal inventory databases, such as, for example, one click LCA. It's a very popular software for running life cycle assessment. So basically, this uh, uh, declaration uh, can help us to collect specific data of specific products. Um, it's important also to know that the APDs uh, um, have to present uh, the result, the data, according to the life cycle of the whole uh, um, product. You can see it here, for example, what it is required, so in terms of data for the APDs, so mostly uh, the phase of the product stage from A1 to A3, so from the extraction and the upstream production of the product up to the manufacturing. So in terms of how much emission are emitted during the production of the product itself. And then after it can be up to the end of life stages. So that's it, very important. The, the third phase, it's the so-called impact assessment. So we need to translate the data and the data set to impact. So basically we are going to use, for example, a sum of APDs, or for example, we are going to use uh, other software that have already incorporated uh, in their databases uh, some other inventory. So for example, there is one very popular that is called EcoInvent that collects more generic data for products. So for example, concrete, and that without specifying a specific company related to that, that produce concrete or bricks and so on. Uh, and then it is important after to sum up um, this, uh, um, this uh, effect, this impact, according to different methodology that are available uh, already in the literature. I, I will show you something after. Uh, the last phase, probably the most important after to understand what this data really mean, is the interpretation phase. So from the data, we can understand after through some graph or figures, what are the most impacting material or component, uh, how the impacts of some products can be reduced, maybe choosing some other material with, with like a better um, emission rate. And what is the most impacting category, environmental category? So for example, global warming rather than uh, acidification potential and so on. 
So um, going through the second point of the list, I wanted to show you um, the research that we have made on the waterproof membrane aimed uh, at uh, radon mitigation in buildings. So you can see here that we have chosen 10 different kinds of membrane that differ for the composition, the chemical composition, and also for thicknesses. Um, there are different um, macro categories, so from bituminous membrane up to polymeric membrane, composite ones, and so on. And the range of this thickness is not the, the thickness that are uh, available um, in general on the market, but they are only um, suitable for radon purposes, so radon mitigation. So, for example, there can be other thicknesses that we haven't considered because the radon resistance of that membrane in that thickness will not be effective in our scope. So, for example, here you can see from this graph uh, a tiny, um, a small uh, selection of membrane uh, five membrane, bituminous, polymeric, and composite, uh, that are uh, evaluated in terms of radon resistance and global warming potential. So, kilogram of CO2 emission equivalent uh, um, emitted while producing this membrane. Uh, that is a very interesting graph because, for example, if uh, um, I've been asked, uh, for example, to um, define what is the most environmentally friendly membrane in terms of global warming only uh, in a radon resistant range that goes from 75 to 100, I can see that I can choose between three different options. So uh, MAPE membrane, PVC or SMA membrane. And at the same time, I can see which thickness I could, uh, I could choose. Uh, according to also how much uh, global warming potential that I would like to use. So in this case, for example, the most environmentally friendly membrane is the MAPE, so a composite membrane, uh, in a thickness that uh, it's around uh, one millimeter. But after, uh, it can be chosen another one in terms of what it is available in my, in my case. Uh, after that, uh, here you can see another graph that introduces a new parameter that it is on the vertical axis on the right side of the graph, which is the single score indicator. At the beginning, I told you that uh, uh, the environmental categories, the 10 that I have listed, they have a different unit of measure. So I cannot sum them up uh, because they will not uh, be um, but it will not be possible to sum them up since they have different units. So a single score indicator is calculated through a methodology that uh, in this case was the CML 2001 normalizing and weighting methodology uh, that through a weighting and a normalizing um, system, uh, thanks to some value for each environmental category, allow me to convert the, um, the value uh, of each environmental category to a value without unit, so that finally I can sum them uh, up, all up, the environmental category that I want to consider, and to achieve one single score indicator that uh, allow me to understand the overall environmental assessment or environmental impact of my product. So in this case, I have uh, calculated here the single score indicator for each kind of membrane in each thickness. It's very important also here that you see that the horizontal axis that um, divide the thicknesses in a section. So in each, in each section, I can see more or less membrane that are available. And on the left side, the vertical axis determine the, uh, present the radon resistance, the average radon resistance. So, for example, if I consider um, a 0.5 millimeter section, I can see that there are two membrane available, a uh, low density polyethylene and a high density polyethylene. And I can see that the best indicator, environmental uh, impact, so is uh, given by the uh, high density polyethylene. And at the same time, uh, it performs better in terms of uh, radon resistance. So here it is, uh, um, like here there is an overview of the steps that we have tracked uh, for running this assessment of the membrane. So we have started with the membrane selection. 
we have analyzed the thicknesses that would have been uh, um, effective in radon protection. We have calculated the radon resistance. We have then uh, um, collected the APDs. In this case, uh, it was a collection of APD, uh, so environmental product declaration. Uh, and from the, this document, we have uh, taken only the embodied impact, so from uh, A1 to A3, so the production stage is uh, impact. We have employed the um, single score indicator methodology uh, to achieve uh, finally one parameter only, and then we have compared the membrane in order to potentially define what is the most environmentally friendly and random and effective membrane for each random resistant range or each membrane thickness. So, in uh, in conclusion of this part, basically. Uh, it is important to note that membranes can bring additional impact if used in high thicknesses, of course, but at the same time, if used in uh, thinner thicknesses, the, um, the radon resistant values decrease, leading to a lower efficient performance. So it is important to find out uh, a balance between them. It is so important to notice that uh, the impact of the uh, radon barrier uh, on the environment can be reduced in three different ways. The first one is to choose the insulation material that has the least impact on the environment. The second is to use membrane uh, that don't exceed unnecessarily the minimum resistant value uh, um, value, uh, and at the same time to um, by overall optimization of the radon protection design. And the third point, the last one in this case, is to verify whether the minimization of the insulation impact is not offset then by the impact caused by the increase in the ventilation uh, and by installing other measures that could also bring additional uh, impact, not only embodied impact, but also operational impact. Um, talking about operational impact, uh, um, we can talk about ventilation system. So there is a new uh, item now in, uh, in our generic system. Uh, there is not only raw materials right now, but we have to add energy consumption that it is employed to let the uh, ventilation system work. So basically energy consumption it's uh, um, is considering now the new stage that is uh, in the life cycle stages. It's called U stage B, and in particular is B6. Um, so product stage and U stage will lead to some emission, and the emission will lead uh, to a contribution in the environmental impact. In particular, uh, for um, performing the life cycle assessment, so the environmental uh, assessment of ventilation system, we divided the work in three different phases. Uh, the first phase is it was to understand what the ventilation system and operation mode we wanted. So um, after we define and we result in the bill of quantities of materials, uh, after that, the phase two was about calculating the operational energy deriving from the operation of fan and the, the cover of lift losses. And these two outputs, so bill of quantities and operational energy demand, were used as input for the phase number three, that it's about the life cycle assessment calculation. And the result was the um, environmental assessment divided their embodied impacts, operational impact, and the overall impact of the whole system. You can see here, basically, uh, the interpretation of the results, so like the famous uh, uh, phase four of the life cycle assessment. So you can see that we have uh, uh, considered two different ventilation systems, uh, centrally balanced ventilation and exhaust ventilation, either employed for uh, 24 hours, so continuously, or 9-15 hours per day. And um, we have also used different, uh, considered different radon supply rate uh, from 50 to 200 becquerel cubic meter hour. And we wanted also to um, consider two kinds of uh, reduction, one to 200 becquerel per cubic meter, and the second one to 100 becquerel per cubic meter. 
Uh, so in this case, um, the radon supply rate has been compared uh, to the single score indicator. So uh, we have uh, some app through uh, another, in this case, methodology for calculating the single score that is called environmental footprint normalization and weighting that it is um, developed, that was developed by the European Commission. Uh, and basically, in this graph, it is very easy to understand that, uh, for example, in the case of radon supply rate of 50, uh, the um, exhaust ventilation is much more impacting than a central imbalance in any case, either to, um, to a reduction to 200 becula per cubic meter and uh, the 1 to 100, because we need to cover the heat losses and the heat losses need more uh, energy. Another important parameter that we have considered is the energy source. The result that you have seen just in the previous uh, uh, graph, um, consider the Czech electricity mix from Czech Republic, that uh, it's quite high compared to the one that you see on the rest of the graph in this slide, because it is uh, still considering uh, this electricity mix, the lignite, so uh, coming from uh, the mines. Uh, so basically, it is also important to use uh, an energy source that is not that impacting on the environment so that the, the emission will be lower after. So here in this case, we have considered wood pellet, natural gas and photovoltaics. But if it is needed to consider the electricity mix, the, uh, this one can be even changed according to the country we are considering. So um, in our paper that you see here um, as a reference, we have considered um, other countries and um, you will see if you have a look at that, that uh, there is a, a very important difference uh, in terms of environmental impact of the electricity mix uh, country by country. So, in uh, general, to conclude this, uh, this section, uh, mechanical ventilation system cannot be considered as a universal radon measure that are um, suitable for any supply rate, because at higher supply rate, the energy consumption of this system and the environmental impact will be very high. Uh, at the same time, in this case, we there is a a limitation because we have just considered the radon uh, as an indoor pollutant, but there may be other pollutants indoor that may affect the air quality. And at the same time, uh, they could lead to higher ventilation rate and energy consumption in a greater amount. Anyway, the environmental impact of this ventilation system can be reduced by following four different approaches that are listed here. So the first one is to avoid to use ventilation system at very high uh, ventilation rate that are uh, unnecessarily in uh, that specific case. It's very important uh, as a second point uh, to uh, select, uh, to pick one of the most uh, uh, um, environmentally friendly energy sources to cover the energy for fans and heat losses. The third point that uh, usually it is the first uh, um, design strategies that you it would be better to adopt is to use a passive radon control technology to in reduce the indoor radon concentration and thereby uh, reduce the overall uh, ventilation energy consumption and the last one but not the less important of course is to choose components of the ventilation system that have the lowest possible environmental impacts um Let's dive in now in the last point of uh, the, the presentation that it's about having a sort of overview of uh, the floor foundation that uh, can we design for both new building or existing building in order to uh, reduce the um, radon risk. In this table, you see that the radon risk, uh, the potential is divided uh, according to the um, low, medium and high and uh, there are principles of protection that are uh, associated to it. So, for example, if we consider radon risk at high potential, uh, we need to consider, of course, to implement in our fall foundation a radon proof membrane that is combined with other uh, solution, radon control technology or measure, such as, for example, uh, uh, ventilation of uh, crawl space or uh, hair gaps uh, ventilation through natural hair and so on. For existing buildings, uh, the measure uh, differ according to the concentration indoor, of course, and uh, their efficiency. 
So, for example, in the case of measure applicable to concentration up to 1000 becquerel per cubic meter with an efficiency up to 75 percent, it will be inter, uh, it will be, um, there will be three different measures uh, suitable in this case, such as, for example, new floors with a, a radon proof insulation membrane plus a passive sous lab or floor air gap ventilation or increase the mechanical ventilation in the uh, habitable space, or even um, place an active sub-slab depressurization installed without the replacement of floor, so through radon sumps or drilled tube below the ground. Um, here there is a, a small overview of um, some variant uh, for a floor venting. Uh, and basically here you can see that there are solutions both passive and active, either for new building or existing building. I just wanted to show you that because here there is a clear overview of the um, uh, global warming potential, so uh, in the kilograms uh, uh, of CO2 emission uh, per square meter. And it is also important to know that this value, it is divided by 50 years, because usually it is considered as life cycle of uh, uh, the building. And another important uh, parameter uh, to consider is the ratio between embodied and operational impact. In the first two variants, variant A and variant B, this ratio doesn't uh, uh, account that much because we just have embodied impacts, 100%, while in the third and fourth variant, uh, there is uh, an important uh, difference between embodied and operational impact because, for example, variant C, uh, it accounts uh, for 81% in embodied impacts while 19 for operational ones. Um, here there is an overview of uh, all the floor foundation that we have uh, uh, considered and assessed. There are more than 15 and they are uh, for uh, new buildings and existing buildings and as I said, uh, passive and active solution. And as you can know, uh, as you can see, uh, active solution are um, mostly employed for uh, existing buildings because passive solution will not be effective enough in those cases. Here there is a graphical representation of the uh, floor foundation. So, for example, P1 represents the radon proof membrane that is installed all over the floor foundation, or uh, P2 represents the radon sumps uh, with the exhaust pipe uh, and also a garden pipe uh, with a roof, uh, um, with a fan, pardon. And, um, for example, P5 represents uh, um, a deep membrane, so venting through uh, through that membrane. Um, I wanted to show you here, for example, uh, the difference in between embodied and operational impact for new buildings, of course. If we consider, for example, the, um, the variant P3, uh, it's divided between 3.1 and 3.2. And the difference is that the 3.1 is the passive solution of uh, ventilation uh, in the subfloor, through perforated pipes in the gravel layer, while 3.2, it's uh, the same, but uh, it has been installed a fan above the roof through uh, an exhaust uh, vertical pipe. So you can see that in the case of 3.1, of course, we are just considering embodied impact, so from the production stage, while in 3.2, we are uh, considering both embodied impact, so the same that were in 3.1, and operational impact, so the one uh, resulting from uh, the energy consumed to let the fan work. So basically, you are already know uh, that uh, uh, 3.2, it will be much more impacting than 3.1, of course. The same, uh, um, it's here for existing buildings, so you can see the ratio between embodied operational and end-of-life impact. Why we are talking about end-of-life impact? Because, for example, in the scenario 3.4, um, the aim was to replace the existing floor of an existing building with a new one. So basically, the floor that has to be dismantled will be sent after to a landfill. So basically, we need to account the impact uh, of this uh, uh, part of material. And then, of course, there will be, again, the embodied impact, the operational impact due to the ventilation of the system. Uh, R7, it's uh, the subfloor ventilation through a uh, radon well. 
And I would like to stress out this one, for example, because after, if we consider as a final graph, let's say, um, all the scenario that I have listed you before in terms of uh, CO2 emission, you will see that uh, um, Aradon well, it's much more impacting on the environment due to the uh, operational emission since uh, the um, the power uh, of the fan of the radon, well, it's, it's much more uh, high than uh, the rest of the fan. So basically passive solution are um, most of the time or either exclusively used for new construction. And uh, there are uh, normally the most environmental friendly solution, but they can be employed only uh, or most of the time for in new buildings. Active measure, uh, so the blue one in, uh, of these columns, uh, the dark blue one. Um, in, in this active measure, the preventive ones, uh, so for new buildings, exhibit a higher proportion of embodied impact as we see in the other um, in the other graph. And in particular, scenario from uh, uh, three point uh, air. 3 to R5.2 that include a replacement of the floor are uh, always associated with preventive measure because basically uh, they need to include the embodied impact due to the necessity of reinstalling new and uh, specific material and products. So they will have, of course, higher impact for that reason. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the objective of this study um, was to present the environmental impacts associated with various uh, radon control technologies, uh, encompassing both active and passive solution for both new and existing buildings. The assessment was uh, performed using the life cycle assessment methodology and uh, um, the single score indicator methodology that I have mentioned in order to have a um, panoramic overview of the environmental impact uh, for each uh, product. Uh, the findings from this research were uh, disseminated in a different uh, research article and conference paper. So if you are curious, uh, please check them out or uh, reach out to us uh, so that we can uh, discuss about. And future works uh, could be based on associating the environmental impact assessment uh, with their efficiency assessment in regard to indoor radon concentration reduction and uh, in particular with, for example, hair tightness of the building and also um, radon transport into the ground. So, for example, diffusion, convention and radon decay. Uh, these would uh, enable to assess the performance of the building uh, about the environmental impact as decision-making support. So it could be very interesting to have this work done. Um, the publication that we have um, released in the last year are listed here. So please, if you are interested, uh, check them out. Uh, of course, there is much more that I have said uh, today, so um, you can understand a bit more probably. And uh, that's all. So, Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, it was clear enough.